In today's video, we're talking about the tiny, super-powered, rare earth magnets that sit at the heart of everything from iPhones to F-35 fighter jets, and how America suddenly realized that nearly every single one of them comes from China. All the sources I used are linked in the description. Picture this. A stealth bomber streaks across the sky on a classified mission. The moment its bomb bay doors swing open, Laser-guided munitions rely on postage-stamp-sized neodymium iron boron magnets to steer with pinpoint accuracy. Yet those magnets trace a supply chain that runs straight through Chinese customs officials. In June, Beijing quietly slashed global magnet exports by more than half, sending shockwaves from Detroit to the Pentagon. If you're wondering how we got here, let's rewind to the 1980s. Back then, the Mountain Pass Mine in California provided most of the world's rare earth ore, while General Motors' MagnaQuench division turned that ore into cutting-edge, permanent magnets. America controlled the raw materials and the know-how, and then, almost overnight, it didn't. In 1995, GM sold MagnaQuench for just $56 million, barely the sticker price of one modern fighter jet. The buyer looked American, but behind the scenes, two Chinese state-linked firms orchestrated the deal. Within a decade, every machine tool from MagnaQuench had been shipped to Tianjin. By 2004, the last U.S. missile-grade magnet line shut its doors, and China began its march toward a 90% share of global magnet production. Fast forward to April 4, 2025. Retaliating against a new round of U.S. tariffs, Beijing imposed export controls on seven medium and heavy rare earth elements, samarium, dysprosium, terbium, and their cousins. These are the exotic dopants that let magnets survive the scorching heat inside jet engines or hypersonic missiles. Suddenly, every shipment required a case-by-case -case export license, and Chinese customs agents started slow walking the paperwork. Within weeks, the impact was visible in hard data. May shipments of Finnish magnets plunged to their lowest level in five years, down nearly 75% from 2024. Ford idled an assembly line for a week. German suppliers warned of cascading plant shutdowns, and US defense contractors quietly drew up rationing plans for critical programs. Here's why that matters. A modern electric vehicle needs about two to five kilograms of neodymium magnets just for its traction motor. Offshore wind turbines rely on hundreds of kilograms per nacelle. A single guided missile carries half a dozen tiny magnets in its fin actuators. Without them, rotors don't spin, guidance chips don't steer, and the green energy transition grinds to a halt. America's vulnerability didn't happen by accident. It's the result of three decades of price wars. Anytime a Western company tried to restart magnet production, Chinese competitors flooded the market with cut-rate material, bankrupting the upstart before the first profits rolled in. The strategy worked. By 2024, U.S. output amounted to a rounding error, barely three-tenths of one percent of world supply. If you're enjoying the video so far, don't forget to hit that like button. It really helps the channel reach more curious minds. So. What's Washington doing about it? In July 2025, the Pentagon signed a multi-billion dollar public-private partnership with MP Materials, the company that resurrected Mountain Pass, to erect a so-called 10X facility, capable of 10,000 metric tons of magnets per year. The deal even grants the Department of Defense a stake big enough to become MP's largest shareholder, locking in a decade-long price floor to protect the plant from another Chinese glut. Meanwhile, Australia's Linus is building a heavy rare earth separation facility in Texas, aiming to supply dysprosium and terbium oxide from non-Chinese mines. Without those heavy elements, magnets lose strength above 150 degrees Celsius, fine for a smartphone, fatal for a jet. Still, the road home is uphill. Even if every announced US project comes online, total capacity would hit maybe 6,000 tons by 2027 about 2% of China's current output, and Beijing hasn't hesitated to weaponize price. When Molycorp tried to revive Mountain Pass a decade ago, Chinese producers drove prices so low that the venture collapsed in bankruptcy. Nothing stops them from trying again once American factories open their doors. Layer on the chemistry problem, separating the heavy elements is devilishly complex and environmentally messy. Today, zero industrial scale, heavy, rare earth separation takes place on US soil, even MP's shiny new lines still ship, concentrate abroad for toll processing during ramp-up. Until America masters that step, a choke point remains. There's also the question of demand. 
the Pentagon uses perhaps 1,000 to 1,200 tons of magnets a year, depending on whose estimate you trust. But commercial EV and wind power sectors need orders of magnitude more. If U.S. industry can't meet volume at competitive cost, Detroit and Silicon Valley will slide back to Chinese suppliers the next time margins get tight. That's why policy architects are deploying every tool in the kit. Defense Production Act grants, 45x tax credits for clean energy components, and long-term offtake guarantees that mimic the way Europe built its battery gigafactories. The strategy is less about beating China on price tomorrow than building a baseline capacity that can't be wiped out by the next price war. Recycling is another front. MP's Apple deal specifies magnets sourced partly from recycled material. Think shredded hard drive platters and retired EV motors. Urban mining won't replace fresh ore, but every kilogram recovered at home is one less hostage to a Chinese export license. Allies are pitching in too. Japan's Daido is scaling up cobalt-free magnet chemistries that cut dysprosium use by 90%. The EU's Critical Raw Materials Act fast tracks permits for new mines in Sweden and Greenland. Canada is offering 10-year tax holidays for rare earth processors willing to build in Quebec or Ontario. Beijing, for its part, is playing a nuanced game, granting just enough licenses each quarter to keep Western plants running hand-to-mouth, never enough to let them stockpile. It's a supply chain boa constrictor, squeeze, release, squeeze again. Each pulse reminds boardrooms that China can switch off the tap whenever negotiations over tariffs, semiconductors, or Taiwan get tense. That leverage even seeps into diplomacy. In June, Washington agreed to ease export controls on certain jet engine technologies in exchange for faster Chinese license approvals, an unprecedented concession that left national security hawks fuming and trade economists nodding at Beijing savvy. So where does this leave the average consumer? If you drive an EV, the next supply squeeze could show up as a months-long delivery delay or a four-figure price bump. If you rely on renewable energy credits, stalled wind turbine projects could push your utility toward more natural gas. The chain reaction is invisible yet everywhere. But it isn't all doom. History shows the United States can mobilize industrial capacity faster than anyone when stakes are existential. Think Liberty Ships and B-29s. The difference today is that the adversary isn't a battlefield foe, but a market juggernaut with decades of momentum. America must relearn the patience of state-backed industrial policy. Boring, expensive, essential. Technologists are already experimenting with ferrite-based motors that swap neodymium for abundant iron oxide powders. They're lighter and less efficient, but a breakthrough in motor control algorithms could close that gap. And additive manufactured magnets 3D printed in complex shapes, promise performance gains that might offset limited material supply. Still, none of those lab miracles will roll off assembly lines tomorrow. For at least the next decade, the West faces a hard truth. Strategic autonomy in magnets will cost more, maybe a lot more, than the bargain basement prices China made the world accustomed to. Whether voters, investors, and regulators are willing to foot, that bill remains the open question. Yet momentum is building. From Omaha recycling startups extracting terbium from fluorescent bulbs to Fort Worth engineers melting recycled iPhones into magnet feedstock, the pieces of a resilient supply chain are snapping into place. The journey back may be long, but this time the stakes, the ability to build cars, turbines, and defense systems without a foreign permission slip are crystal clear. So the next time your phone vibrates, remember, a magnet the size of your fingernail connects geopolitics climate policy, and national security. It's a reminder that critical materials aren't abstract commodities. They're the invisible threads that bind modern life. And right now, those threads still run through Chinese ports. All sources are linked in the description, including a previous video on why four Chinese automakers earn more per car than Tesla. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.